it's really inspired a lot by like dance and you know dance was kind of like my introduction to music far before I was like ever writing or recording I was always just dancing and so getting to be able to express that and like say it how I want to is it's an awesome thing you know yeah and and so so you talk talk about dancing being one of the first things that made you want to be an artist mm -hmm. like what were some other early musical influences uh I think like mainly my uh, my mother's taste in music she really liked uh, Pac and um, she was really into uh, the uh, the uh, why am I oh the Fugees yeah so like Lauryn Hill and Wyclef and Pac were like the hip hop side that my mom really listened to and then she was into a lot of like neo soul and um, you know R&B and and then they, I mean, from like the earliest age, the first music I was introduced to was Michael Jackson. That's probably why I love dance so much. And I think that's a lot of people's introduction, but they gave me a lot of the content. So I was able to thoroughly, you know. Get inspired. Learn yeah. from him, yeah. Yeah. And when did you first start taking it seriously? Uh, I think the first performance that I had was graduating from preschool. I, pre mm -hmm. I did a Michael Jackson impersonation <laughs> at my graduation. Um, I did talent shows probably starting since I was like in second grade and uh, then I went on to like record for the first time in a studio. One of my mom's friend's sons uh, owned his own studio and we went by there because my mom knew that I liked music and um, I didn't I didn't record the first time I came there. I just got to see the studio. But I mean, since a very young age, I was always just like very into creation. Like I like creating things. Um, do you remember the the occasion where you wrote your first song? Yeah, I think uh, it was a song called Jaden Song. It was uh, from before I got into actual music. I was I was writing a lot of poems. I did like Young Authors, which is like a like a writing competition in Chicago where you like write a short story or a book. I did that, and I started doing collection of like collections of poems for those books, and eventually, I got into music a little bit more. But yeah, I remember my first song was called Jaden Song. It was for my little cousin who was sick, but it was just a song about, you know, love. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, your new your new record is, is uh, um, among m some other topics. Yeah. Mainly celebrating love. Yeah. I mean, the best. I feel like older songs a lot of times they're about love you know like the songs that you can remember they yeah about love loss or you know new love or like trying to find love or you know adoration of material things sometimes can be passed off as love too but i feel like you people like songs about things that they love do you do you hear music these days that you think kind of celebrates things like material possessions and like bragging about them too much would you say do you, would you say that's increased uh, in that I don't think it's I think it's there's like an ongoing like uh, like hmm I, w I don't want to say that it's increased it's just there's this idea that like music and things are supposed to you know, like music and, and media are supposed to sell, you know. Product. Uh, yeah, like uh, anything, like what uh, cars or clothes or a certain lifestyle or love or whatever, like those things are used alongside with whatever they're trying to advertise and music becomes advertisement. And I think rap is just like the main medium that people consume now. So that's like where you'll find most of like your ad space is rap songs for sure but, uh i think like you know since day one like since the invention of music or or recorded music or or just like stories like as like to like remind somebody of something else you know like to uh, either help you forget something or help you remember something and like just in the time that we live uh Music is the main medium for selling shit. And I, I, in, in, the, in these tweets that I just read, I noticed you describe music as like, I think you described it as your fuel. 
Yeah. And like the, the thing that keeps you going. But, but you know, in, in this interview, you've mentioned that it was first like dance and like poetry and like other art forms. Would you say music is like the main art form that, that really engages you? Does it take precedence uh, now over, over any? Yeah, I, well, I would say like, for me, like music is like compartmentalized into different things. So like there's me just listening to other people's music that I, uh, something I love to do. There's me just writing music that I love to do. There's recording or producing or performing. And uh, you know, there's all these different like modes in which I engage with music, but Honestly, just being a grown man, like I like other shit too. Like I don't only like to make music now. I like to hang out with my friends and with my family, and you know, go travel and stuff like that. Like I think being realistic, like everybody grows up and they want their dream job to be something that makes them happy. But yeah. like, regardless if it's your dream job or not, like it's still a job. So like there's always like more important or impactful releases or ways to have fun. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I mean, you must have, well, it's clear that you've worked like extremely hard um, to get where you are. So, at, you know, at this stage, having released, you know, your first studio album, uh, do, you, do you ever feel like, you know, like the last seven, eight years that like you've worked? Oh, yeah. Like I definitely, you, are you saying like, do I feel do, do like- Do you feel like you've ever worked like too hard that you need a break sometimes? And oh yeah, all the time. I think like that's like what it is to be an American though. Like we all just work and work and work and you know, like it's whether you're working to get a house or working to get a car or working to get by, like we all work and we all complain about how tired we are and we all, you know, probably make less than we should. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's just like a part of living, I guess, or living here. Yeah. And um, so one, one of the things that's really interesting, aside from your art, is like your entrepreneurship. So like the, your, your, you know, resistance to getting signed um, and your like clear intent to do things on your own terms. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a subject that you've spoken to uh, a lot of people about and you've kind of lay, laid out advice for, for younger people. Um, I'd just like to hear a few more of your thoughts because this is such a crucial part of your, your career as to like, why you never wanted to get signed and why you wanted to, things, to do things independently and also what gave you the confidence to do that. Word, yeah. I just came up at a, at a good time. Like when uh, it was kind of like no embargo set on how music was getting shared. And so because of YouTube and Facebook and um, Twitter and SoundCloud, I was just in a, in a perfect space to like not have to have a physical form of my music that you, know, that you have to pay to get created and then try and sell. I could just share my music with, with people around the world and you know, have people become fans and invested without having to actually put money down and then, you know, kind of hedge the bet on whether they're going to come to shows or buy merchandise off of that connection. And when the music industry first started, it was, uh, you know, record labels literally pressed records for people. And so, yeah. you know, like they had cornered the market on vinyl, on, you know, recording studios. Um, and had those same relationships that they have with radio stations and media companies that they have now. But at the time, they were the people that you had to go to to get a record made. And when people were trying to sign me, I was in a place where I didn't need a record company to actually produce the content. And so when I almost did my first deal, my caveat was that I wanted to have my albums come out without a physical release with no mechanical copies because that's where I heard that a lot of people were losing their money like they'd be in debt to the record companies because the record company would pay to press however many CDs and then they wouldn't sell enough and and did you know did record companies like kind of force that upon artists uh, yeah to how many like copies were getting made of their album of course yeah they choose a lot of stuff for artists and what do you think was their pro like thought process 
behind that given the decline of like vinyl and CDs? Well, this is the thing, like it's like you have to couple the music with something. Like if you're selling music at a time, selling music was selling a CD or selling a record or selling a tape. And you want to sell as many as possible so they would produce as many as possible and then sell them to these retailers and try and get their, you know, their albums going. And sometimes they just didn't have the right promotional campaign or they just overinvested in CDs or maybe they didn't target the market correctly, whatever it was. Like, I think the idea that I had was just that I would rather, you know, do all my copies digitally. And at the yeah. time they said music wasn't being uh, consumed that way and that it would be better to just have CDs. And so I didn't take that deal, but well, I, uh, it turned out to be the right thing, didn't it? Yeah, I think it's just, I still believe to this day that ownership of the music that you create, like being the owner of, of your masters and, you know, the owner of your publishing and, you know, uh, just like making those decisions as the person that makes the music, I think that just makes the most sense. Yeah, it definitely does, and it, it was just, I guess it was just a bit, you know, business opportunity for the labels back at, back at the birth of popular music for yeah. them to do that, and things are different now. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, like I said, like music or, you know, content in the way that we receive it now, whether it's on TV or via the radio or on a website, like, there's always advertisements around yeah and that's because like the way that we receive it is it's not like advertisement in between content it's like content in between advertising so like the most important thing is selling something else and at, there was a time where the labels you know quantified music via how many units of plastic that they were selling but now it's like you know streams or whatever they want to call it. I don't know like it's there's always different modes of music but I think the music music itself will always be faster than the music industry so they'll always be playing catch up and the creators will just have to keep getting more creative and you noticed early you know, early on or kind of read the music industry in the sense that you you knew that you were going to make your money from touring and from selling merchandise. Like when when you first like dropped your first mixtape, did did you already have this like n you know kind of like s seemingly like a game plan? And uh, no. What what was what what was the sort of situation back then? Did you just want to create something and put it online and see what? Yeah, I was just like any other kid. I think at the time where people used to send out press kits to uh, labels and like you know, try and send their album out and shit. Um, but yeah, there was no interest in me <laughs> whatsoever at the time. And I think I just, I think for one, the movie industry has done a great job at depicting how shady, you know, you know some, uh, some labels can be and some managers can be and some, you know, uh, agents can be or whoever they have in the movie like it's usually like you know those people aren't the good guys at the end yeah. of the movie about whatever artist life it is and so I guess I was lucky to have that uh, you know um, you know just sense of like caution uh, going into everything but yeah I don't know I think we just have to be, con you know, in control of our destiny and our output, and uh, and not, you know, succumb to the idea of being a part of that system as it stands. And one of one of the things that's made, you know, giving you artistic freedom is is this choice. And that artistic freedom you've used to collaborate with so many people, whether it's like Gucci Mane or, I mean, quite left field recently like Death Cab and um, Randy Newman. Yeah. So like, talk me through that, like th those, those choices for your, for your albums, like they, they're, they're awesome and like totally not what you'd expect, expect. Yeah, what's weird is like, I've always felt like, 
you can kind of sense what artists you like based off of what artists you like before them, you know, and kind of like find a connection between artists because a lot of times artists are influenced by other artists. And I grew up listening to Death Cab and uh, obviously Randy Newman is ingrained in all the kids in, in my age group's memory just from like working on Disney songs. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I always wanted to work with Death Cab. I always wanted to work with Randy Newman, just listening to them forever. And then for this album, it was just based a lot in nostalgia and, and um, things that remind me of childhood or high school or, you know, just decisions I made in my life before I got married. And it felt right to have Randy Newman just because he's, you know, the king of, of childhood memories for me. And Death Cab was all I listened to in high school. <laughs> And it sounded like it was a really, like in particular with Randy Newman, like a very like, unusual process for him. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, because I like, read an interview with him in Rolling Stone, he was talking about your day at the studio together. I think he was pretty like, stoked and like, really impressed with like, the way that you worked in the studio. That's like the vibe, the vibe that I got from him. Did, yeah. you, did, um, did you share that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm j uh, I don't know how to say it any better than I, it's an honor to work with Randy Newman. Yeah. Like when I, when he came to the studio, uh, he he's an older gentleman. Like he's, you know, like did not have to come all the way down to the studio in this basement where it smells like weed and there's <laughs> like you know, a bunch of random people. Not random people, but my friends. Random to Randy, you know. Yeah. Uh, but he came through and worked for hours and you know wrote new music and replayed chords and you know did his thing like I that's what I like is like regardless of the age difference or you know like a lot of artists that I've worked with have way more accolades and have been way doing it longer than me but like having that at least like a, a level playing field or like equal respect for each other in the realm of like creating new stuff you know like because it doesn't matter like what our, how different our experiences are, or how much older or younger than we are. Like at some point in the future, it's gonna feel like it was one thing. And if we're not, you know, connected, then it's it's gonna feel disjointed. Yeah, and it, and clearly in the studio as well. Like you, you know, even at the age of seventy-five, you you know, he was talking about how he was having to improvise new lyrics in the studio, which was like the first time that he's ever done that. Yeah, so it's pretty cool that you've made you know at, at that age giving him like something totally fresh yeah it's funny how many people like i was working with in the studio that were like this is not how i work <laughs> like yeah i worked with regina specter who to me is one of the greatest artists of all time she i hope you guys are interviewing her uh i think we have been in touch with her yeah definitely link with regina specter she's amazing and she uh we worked with, with her on a few songs for the album that didn't end up going on but like i spent a long time in atlanta georgia just working on my album and having different people come out and Regina was one and she was the same way though she was like I've never improvised music in the studio that's why I like to jam like just make stuff everybody live and I'll freestyle my lyrics and then you know produce it afterwards so you had a big hit this summer with with Ed Sheeran how did you meet and uh, what was it like working in the studio with him uh, it was awesome, y'all. I'm a huge Ed Sheeran fan. Like, I, I've known him since 2013. I met him when I first went out on tour with Mac Miller. And, uh, yeah, he introduced us, and it was super cool. And, uh, I mean, I just think, I think he's an awesome songwriter, firstly, and obviously very appreciated around the world. Um, but, yeah, he uh, came into Chicago like a few months back and he, I don't think he was on tour or anything I think he was just traveling like he's very like eclectic he doesn't like have a phone or anything he's like doesn't have security he just like walks around and shit so like he came by the studio and we kicked it for two days and recorded a couple songs one of them that was supposed to go on my album but I ended up uh, keeping and uh, um, and then yeah, and then we did the Cross Me song, which I love. And yeah, yeah he's just a, he's a cool dude. And one of my final questions is, gonna, is, is, is sort of like, 
your your albums, like particularly, well, your mixtapes, mm -hmm. like Acid Rap, Coloring Book, like those are considered, you know, some of the best albums of, of like the last ten years by so many people. that like they've topped all sorts of critics lists and things like that. Um, did you feel pressure, kind of calling this latest record like your first studio album? And what what was the kind of like decision making process behind that? Uh, I think I always knew that I was gonna make. Uh, my album after coloring book um, and I think it's there was like a thought process behind like you know finally putting out a physical form of of my music and kind of like changing the access idea like I've always just been about access having as many people as possible be able to listen to it and, and there's so much demand at this it, point so yeah so like getting to a point where all my music could be on streaming services that people use. Like back in the day, SoundCloud was like the only streaming one. And yeah. now everybody's got a DSP. Um, but yeah, just making my music more accessible was I think the main idea behind it. And just getting to a point into an uh, adulthood where I feel like I'm in my final form. Like it's the perfect time to like take another big step. Yeah. I think it was definitely the right step to take and I think it really holds up alongside your other records as well. So Thanks, I man. think you should be really proud of it. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time to do this interview. Thank you, man. Appreciate nice it. Yeah. Great to meet you.